Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, what we have up on the computer right now, is it's actually a game called Epidemic by Strategic Simulations, but more importantly, it's an example of how you use a computer to choose among alternatives, make a decision, uh, establish a, a complex strategy for solving a problem. The problem in this case is a worldwide epidemic caused by viruses coming in from outer space. What we see here on the first screen is a view of the world, our first bit of information. It shows us the different regions of the world. For instance, Region 7, which is in Western Europe, it shows us we have a 2.5 level epidemic there. The arrows show us whether it's getting worse, better are staying the same. We have a projection in days, in seven days, it'll get really serious in that country. Uh, whether or not any remedies are being applied there, what the success or failure rate of those remedies are, and how many people have died in that particular country. We see, say, 16 million people it shows, of, it shows us have already died in Western Europe. I can go to a next screen now, and this is a satellite view of the world, as you can see. And we'll be tracking right now these meteorites that are coming in from space, carrying the there virus. There's a meteorite here coming in over Africa. There? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we now have to decide whether or not to use missile launchers to try to intercept these things, or whether we should just go ahead and try to solve the epidemics on the ground. And I'm going to have to wait for a second till it tracks uh, this very slow-moving uh, meteorite right there. Now we can go to a third screen and, as you can see, get even more information. This is another uh, status report on the world. And those countries in which there are these dotted liney patterns means there's a problem. We can see Western Europe, in fact, has a problem. Mm -hmm. So we can go inside Western Europe and get even more information about what's going on and for the first time start to look at the choices we have, the decisions we have to make in terms of trying to attack this problem. We see we have a total of 12 different remedies we could apply to this situation to try to solve the problem. And the more information I can get uh, is to actually apply one of these remedies uh, say in this case Alpha-2, which is using a vaccine in that particular case. I noticed also that it was showing you uh, the percentage probability that a certain remedy would actually help. So this is where the computer system is Right, and also it's out. showing me a projection mm -hmm. as to the percentage of reduction I would get mm -hmm. from uh, using that particular mm -hmm. remedy. Now we can go back to our world view again and see what, what happened when we tried that vaccination in Western Europe, whether it worked, whether it didn't work, and that helps us make the next decision. Now, this is just a game, Gary, but as I say, it's a good example of how the computer helps me make decisions, choose from alternatives. What we're talking about, more or less, is something called computer-aided decision-making, I suppose, or decision support systems, and like some of these other things we've talked about, the first trouble is trying to define mm -hmm. what it is we are talking about. How would you define a decision support system? Well, I think a decision support system is a catch-all phrase for a lot of different concepts, but as we've seen here, this is an example of the computer system is helping uh, say a manager or a decision maker with strategies, long-term strategies, and giving information about uh, that will help, s sort of an able assistant in many cases. Now, the underlying technology might be, uh, say, expert systems, relational databases, and even spreadsheets as a part of the tools that would be used in decision support. But uh, it's a new area, and I think that it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, our experts tell us about this. Okay, we're actually going to be using a decision support system to make some real business decisions later on in the program. First, let's go out and see how computer-aided decision-making is being used right now. Decision support systems encompass a broad range of analytical tools, from forecasting programs that calculate trends and predict outcomes, to expert systems that can draw conclusions and make their own decisions. Whether or not decision aids require some degree of artificial intelligence, they are presently in routine use, having proven their efficiency and accuracy in a number of applications. At a major American railroad, decision support systems were designed in-house to assist in long-term financial and operations planning. Based on forecasts of future demand, the system reviews records of train capacities, labor costs, taxes, fuel costs, and revenues to predict the financial impact of alternative strategies. The potential risks and benefits of various models can be demonstrated graphically. An early system called Prospector analyzes the mineral content of geological formations and recommends drilling sites. Containing many of the features associated with artificial intelligence, Prospector asks for information on rock types, ground appearance, and rock chemistry. The user responds with a number from plus 5 to minus 5 on a scale of probability. 
Prospector draws conclusions based on these probabilities and makes its own recommendations. The system can also carry on a dialogue with its user who can question the program's interim choices as it progresses. Unlike Prospector, the most common types of decision support systems require known facts rather than probabilities, and they cannot respond to queries about how decisions are reached. But future research is likely to narrow the gap between programs that lay the groundwork for decisions and programs that can make the decisions. Joining us now is Mike Thoma. Mike is Vice President of Management Decision Systems of Boston, Massachusetts. And next to Mike is Steve Weil. Steve is Vice President with Syntelligence of Menlo Park here in California. Gary? Uh, Steve, uh, I guess the concept of a decision support system is a relatively new idea, at least a commercial application. Can you give us some idea of how uh, decision support systems are actually used? Yeah. Well, we actually specialize in decision support systems that are sometimes called knowledge base or expert systems. Mm -hmm that try to bring uh, the actual judgment uh, of an expert to the desktop of a manager or a business professional in the course of making a particular kind of decision. For example, we're working right now on a system that will help commercial lending officers at banks make decisions about small companies and their credit worthiness. So we'll actually try to capture the type of industry knowledge that a lender who had been lending for a long time to the restaurant business or some other business would bring in analyzing the financial statements and management experience of a restaurateur uh, in deciding whether or not they're worthy for a loan that they're applying for. Mike, does a decision support system have to be the expert system like Steve is describing? No. Um, <clears throat> decision support systems don't need to be an expert system like Steve is deciding. I have related a lot of times when people have asked me that question, a story that happened with my father who is 78, a consultant, I said, Dad, I'd like you to sell you a decision support system. He said, I don't need a decision support system. I make the decisions. You give me an alternative evaluation system, I'm interested. But otherwise, forget it. So I think that um, the, the requirement of adding on an expert system is like hiring a consultant. And a decision support system can be used as a very well-trained uh, assistant who's going to carry out the analysis that, that I direct. And it provides you with a lot of high-level information as a result of that? It'll provide mm -hmm. me with a lot of high-level information. and. Um, analyses and maybe mm -hmm. hopefully even more questions. Is interactivity a key element of a decision support system? I mean, d d does the system have to respond uniquely to the questioner? My own feeling is that the decision support systems really do have to be interactive. And the reason is that you're in a decision making process and it's very close to an innovation process, which is you have an idea, you'd like some feedback. And to operate in a non interactive mode would be to say, Gee, I've had an idea. What do you think about it? Uh, send it through the mail. Uh, Thirteen weeks later, you get an answer, no. I forgot what I said. I forgot what the information was, and I, I haven't uh, been able to do it. So it's um, interactivity and responsiveness to an idea that generates another one. So this is typically, typically going to be then uh, connected to a larger computer system where there's some sort of a database that gives you the facts and figures that you're going to try to put together then. You certainly um, want to be operating in an interactive environment, and I think the um, and you certainly want to be connected to a computer, um, whether it's big or not, um, mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the problem. Uh, right. okay. Steve, do your systems depend on a mainframe, in fact? Uh, yes, the systems we're initially developing will depend on a mainframe, though given the direction that personal computers are going these days, I expect that within a few years, uh, at most, our systems will in fact run on, on future personal computers. On this element, by the way, of interactivity, we are so concerned about that uh, that we have spent a lot of time ensuring that our systems provide full explanation of how they came to the conclusions they came to. We think that managers and professionals do not have the ability to point at the computer and say, the computer told me to make that loan. Uh, now it's too bad that uh, the company went bust or whatever. We think that really our products have to work as a staff assistant in the same way that a good staff assistant would explain how they came to a conclusion. They need to give full explanation of their reasoning. Mike, you have your company system up here, and the hypothetical we're creating here is uh, suppose the Computer Chronicle Show would like to buy a software company, okay? And we want to use your system to help us make that decision. Uh, and we initially, I think, identified what 62 software companies that were out there. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you use this system to give me the information we needed to, to make that decision? Okay, what we have here is a, a database of Standard & Poor's CompuStat data in a 
product that we market called Express Easy Scan. And as you suggested, we've zeroed in on the on the uh, software marketplace. We'll pick it up here and let's say, let's see what publicly held companies um, are going to show up that are in our 62 um, consideration set. So, what are you asking for now, Mike? Do you, are we interested in seeing those companies yes, right yes, now? Let's yeah. just take a brief look at at those 62 companies, um, which will just roll right through here. Um, they're in any random order. They happen to be by the ticker symbol. So it would be like uh, scanning through the, um, the San Francisco Chronicle or whatever through the, through the pages at the back and saying, gee, these are the companies that happen to be in the, in the software business. And my job right now is to zero in on those that I, I think are, are more interesting. And my first cut, um, now that I see that there's 62 and my decision isn't simple, um, I'd like some help in, in going a little farther. So um, one of the things that I'm interested in is um, um, to be able to say, I like a really high growth company. So um, I'd like to screen on a company um, a little bit farther and so rather than just taking those 62 that are right there, I'd like to use some data that's in the database uh, to help me with that. And so EasyScan is asking me which screening criteria do I want. I'm into growth, and I'd like growth greater than, let's say, 30% um, um, sales growth. Um, let's say it's over the, uh, you know, since ending up in 1982, since some of them may have different um, time periods. Sitting in there. So, so what, you're asking for a subset of those 62 which have a growth rate of 30 percent or more over the past five-year period right. up to 1982. Compound growth rate. Mm -hmm. So we've mm -hmm. seen that the um, EasyScan has given us 12 companies are now in consideration. Um, I'm curious as to who they are. Uh, that might give me a, a hint. Um, but before looking at them, I might want to rank them a different way. And that might give me some more information rather than just the, the raw data. So I'll ask the company, the um, Ask EasyScan to jump over and and move into a ranking mode. Um, yeah, I think I will rank them. I can operate in one finger mode and just hit one. And the sorting criteria will be on, well, in addition to growth, I'm interested in profitability. So like my president, I'll ask for margins higher, preferably. <laughs> and it, the system is smart enough to rank uh, numeric data from high to low. Um, and the ranking is complete. So. What I'd like to do now is just take a quick look at those. Why don't I show those? And um, so we would now see the 12 companies which the computer has picked in the ranking you've asked it to do. Right, which is on from high to low and in terms of after tax. And here they are. Mm -hmm. Right. So these first two look pretty good. Uh, I can specify those two ticker symbols. Um, or I can keep it, um, if I didn't want to see all of those, I could do it by attribute again, which is to just rank them and keep the... Okay, could we get to see a graphic comparison of the top two ranking companies? You'd like the number to keep is two? You ask, we respond. No problem. <laughs> All right. Two companies are in consideration. So what I'd like to do now, I'm done with my ranking. I'd like to graph. Um, for some of the people in the audience are interested in bars and venture capitalists. That's where they're found a lot. And uh, <laughs> how about the last five years? That's okay, last five years. No problem. So. And it's putting together the graph right now? Right. So it's back there thinking away um, and preparing a graph on those two companies, which I've promptly forgotten, um, selecting out the last five years. Um, it asked me if I want to save this for later on. I said, no, let's just let's move right ahead. And this is yeah. operating over a fairly low speed line. If you were plugged into your own computer, it would be a little bit faster. Okay, you are plugged into your company's mainframe somewhere right. else. Right, it's right going now. through the um, a public network at uh, 1200 baud. Um, I happen to operate at 4000 in my office, or the one I'm plugged into the lo little local machine that we have, it's uh, 96. And there we are. So uh, the decision is yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, assuming we want to go ahead and negotiate with one of these two companies to acquire them, we'd want to develop a kind of negotiating strategy. Well, that gets to our next decision support system we'll be looking at in just a moment.
Joining us now is Jim Chapman. Jim is Vice President with Human Edge Software of Palo Alto, California. Jim, you have another example of a decision support system here, some, a product you have called Sales Edge. Tell us what that is. Yes, Stuart. Somewhat different than the other packages that have been shown earlier, uh, this package works on the IBM PC and it's for your personal computer. It's to give you a step-by-step -step strategy report in such areas as sales, negotiation, and management. The particular product that I brought here is the Sales Edge and I've loaded in 81 questions about the salesman himself, something about his, his characteristics, his attitudes towards sales, and generally we get a snapshot view as we complete these items of who the salesman is and how they're likely to let's, think. Let's assume Gary's the salesman here and uh -huh. okay. complete your profile. <laughs> that was rejected as an encyclopedia salesman <laughs> right out of high school. So. The item that's up here now, Gary, uh, okay. you have the opportunity to either agree or disagree. It describes mm -hmm. you. Okay. Sometimes a sales call makes me nervous. Always makes me nervous. <laughs> I like the freedom uh, to travel a sales job gives that. me. Mm -hmm. I enjoy swapping stories with That's customers. That's a lot of fun, sure. <laughs> I am sensitive to criticism Don't from like customers. Don't like criticism. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I enjoy putting one over on a customer. Well, I'll go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> there goes your public interest. <laughs> I like, I like talking at company meetings. Okay. Okay, we've completed that section, and again, we uh, are going to go ahead and store that information simply by putting it out on the disk yet. Okay, again, that was just a small sample of the normal dialogue exactly, that would take place. Exactly, exactly. We're at the main menu now, and we won't look at the instructions. We've already completed the assessing yourself. Let's go ahead and take a look at a customer I've already loaded in here. And uh, we'll bring up the, the customer profile by simply putting in the, uh, the name of the file name. File name is Monroe. That's logged in. And what we can take a look at here is a series of adjectives that we've already logged in ahead of time that either we agree or disagree describe that particular customer. For example, talkative, we disagreed. Uh, apprehensive, we agreed to. Now what we can do is go ahead and uh, move on to see the actual report itself. And we'll bring the report up on the screen here in a second. So we're now going to ask for the software's version of what strategy to take in selling this customer who's exactly. been profiled. What's real interesting about this is, of course, you can use it every time you're going to work for the second time with a particular customer. You get a, a feel for what he's like, and you're able to put that information in to the computer so that you can get this strategy. And it will tell you where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and where you're able to work more effectively with them. Jim, how successful has this been in actually a uh, sales situation? You it's actually, that out? Yeah, it's actually very successful. I've used it myself, and so has a number of customers across the country in beta testing. And we modified it so that it would work more appropriately. And what we're getting back from customers, over a thousand of them uh, across the country now, is that it is very useful. Mm -hmm. And just planning a strategy before you do okay. anything. Jim, while we're waiting for it to get its information together, is it superficial in a way? I mean, can you really come up with a meaningful, and you're going to make a business decision based on 86 kind of quick yes and no questions? I think you can, and I'll tell you the reason why. It's actually a cross-fertilization of um, two areas of research, and we're looking at the research when we're taking um, and putting together the strategy itself. The research is on personality and also in the application that we're talking about here in sales. For example, as we roll through here, we saw the what to expect section. We'll see at the very end the closing strategies. We're going to select the most appropriate closing strategy for a particular customer based on how they're likely to think and how they're likely to, to close a sale. I noticed that uh, in the report that this goes back to Steve's comment earlier that the, the program does make uh, some, doesn't analyze the situation, tells you why it's making certain recommendations. And I think that this is probably the important part. You can take that for what it's worth. Yes. Um, it's, it would be very hard for me to trust, say, a program that was on diskette to make a decision about the way my business would go. Yeah, it's important to note <clears throat> that uh, there are multiple diskettes 
Um, mm -hmm. For example, this particular report is asking for another disk yet. To Why don't you put that report. in now? Maybe okay. we'll have time to just see what those closing sure. strategies were. While we're waiting for that, Steve, maybe I can get you back in here. How far can we go with this kind of decision support uh, system stuff? Are we, uh, we going get, to get into making legal decisions, governmental decisions beyond uh, loan decisions? Well, I think that many uh, legal and governmental uh, decisions could be approached with these types of systems, but I do think that the state of the art of the technology is such that that's still three or five years off. If you look at the kind of events that influence the sovereign heads of governments, or the kind of changes that happen in the law, these are quite a bit more difficult to model than lending decisions. Is there a danger that, say, at some point in the, in the evolution of the uh, decision-making programs like this, that people would tend to rely on them? Uh, that certainly is always a danger, and that, that is a general thing with computer systems. We believe that these systems will improve decision-making, but they can't be followed slavishly. They really are only giving recommendations. Jim, we have about one minute. Maybe you can rip us through the conclusions here. <laughs> okay, well, we're in about midway through the report, and it's telling us how to present information to this customer, Monroe, and we're getting information about this particular fellow, and he's detailed-oriented to present the details. That's important to close this customer. And it says, like, find out what his business needs are. I mean, that, that sounds like the kind of stuff you might just read out of a sales text, but you're saying it's tailored to these people. Exactly. If it's an impulsive character, you wouldn't want to find out anything about his business needs. You go right to the close. It's immediate close. This fellow is not one of those individuals. Speaking of immediate closes, Jim, <laughs> we've got to do one of those right now. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine. I'm Susan Bimba, sitting in for Stuart Chaffe. In the Random Access files this week, the government is investigating 12 semiconductor makers across the country. All are suspected of selling faulty, counterfeit, or inadequately tested chips. Officials of National Semiconductor say it's likely the company will be indicted soon as the result of a grand jury inquiry. National Semi has been under investigation for about two years, suspected of inadequately testing chips it sold to government contractors. The chips have been used in every from military jet bombers to satellites to radios and walkie-talkies. In 1982, National Semiconductor admitted its chips hadn't gotten the required hours of heat stress testing and was barred from selling to government contractors for about three months. The company and its officials could face criminal charges, be fined or be sued by the government for the money paid for the chips. New legislation has been introduced that should make computer hackers here in California feel a little less secure. The state legislature will be reviewing a proposal that would make it a misdemeanor to break into any computer system, even if there's no malicious intent. The hacker could be charged with a felony if malicious intent is proven. The current law addresses the problem of malicious hacking, but supporters of the proposal say the old law is too narrow in its focus. They say the new proposal might keep some potential hackers from invading computer systems for the thrill of it. Commodore has released the figures for its second fiscal quarter. In the quarter ending December 31st, Commodore's profit margin was $50.1 million. That's more than double the profit margin of the previous year's second fiscal quarter. Commodore is also experiencing a major shift among its executives. Four have resigned in the last two weeks. 
They include the acting president of Commodore's U.S. unit, marketing vice president, the systems engineering director, and a director of materials. The resignations occurred just two weeks after Jack Tremail left the company. The home computer maker says the resignations are not related. The company is delaying plans to debut its new computer. The 264 was due to be released in April. Commodore's general manager says decisions on the kind of programs to include and what price to charge have pushed back the 264's introduction date. Apple has been reorganized since the introduction of the Macintosh and New Lisa computers. Company president John Scully has changed it from a six-division operation to a three-division operation. The Apple II division will be in charge of Apple II and III. The Apple 32 division will handle the Lisas and Macintosh and all 32-bit system products. The accessory products division will be responsible for the equipment such as printers, keyboards, and communications products. Apple also plans to open a plant in Mexico. It's being called Apple de Mexico. The government of Mexico requires that companies wanting to sell computers in that country operate their plants there, and the plants must be majority owned by a Mexican entity. It's estimated that Apple computers make up about 40 percent of Mexico's personal computer market. Some owners of Hewlett-Packard computers will be able to hook up to a nationwide network soon and they won't need a telephone. HP and the Vitalink Communications will market a high-speed data communications network with the help of a satellite. That's good for HP and Vitalink, but may cut into some of IBM and AT&T's business. 400 workers of the Storage Technology Corporation got the news that they were being laid off. They were called into the cafeteria of the Santa Clara plant Friday afternoon and told they had to be out of the building in about two hours. Storage Tech was working on a large IBM-compatible mainframe computer. During 1981 and 82, business was brisk for the company, but when 1983 began, so did a steady decline in Storage Tech sales. So the Colorado-based company decided to close the Santa Clara operation and get what it called a substantial write-off. Approximately 100 employees will be held over, so the the company can make use of the chip technology it's developed in the Silicon Valley. Well, if you've joined the chorus that's saying video games are a thing of the past, you may have to change your tune soon. And the praises you're singing might be about computer games. As people are becoming more computer-oriented, they are more willing to relax with them. And what better way to break up the monotony of working at a computer than by plugging in your favorite entertainment software and playing a while. Several Silicon Valley companies have switched from video games to computer games and say business is booming. But both video and computer game enthusiasts say they can coexist and make a profit at the same time. That's it for this week's Random Access File. Stuart Chaffee will be back next week. I'm Susan Bimba. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine.